This is a Chronicle podcast, bringing you ideas in the service of medicine. From the Chronicle podcast system, this is Vendor on Psoriasis with Dr. Ron Vendor. Based on the popular Vendor on Psoriasis column in the Chronicle of Skin and Allergy, Dr. Vender provides brief synopses of recent significant clinical developments in psoriasis research, and provides his observations and comments to accompany each report. In each episode, Dr. Vender will answer questions and offer his expert observations and anecdotes on treating this chronic disease. If you have a question for him or want to be in touch at any time, just send an email to vender at chronicle.org. That's V-N-D-E-R at chronicle.org. And, if you attach a voice clip, we might even use your question on an upcoming episode. Support for this podcast comes from Sun Pharma Canada. Sun Pharma is a world leader in specialty therapeutics and is now positioned to be an even larger contributor to the Canadian dermatology landscape. Learn more at www.sunpharma.com. And now... Here's Jeremy Visser. From the labs to trials to your office. Here comes Dr. Vendor on psoriasis. Don't they use that, but do try this. It's Dr. Vendor on psoriasis. Dr. Vendor on psoriasis. Welcome back. I'm Jeremy Visser of the Chronicle of Skin and Allergy. You're listening to the Vendor on Psoriasis podcast with Dr. Ron Vendor. In our 11th episode, Dr. Vendor will be talking about psoriasis flares from systemic steroids, acetretin methotrexate therapy in pediatric patients, and adalimumab with methotrexate versus adalimumab monotherapy. Dr. Vendor, it's our penultimate episode for this season. I thought I would point that out as there's really not a lot of times to use the word penultimate. Totally agree with you, Jeremy. Totally agree. You know, ultimate we use, pen we use, but never together, never together. Our first study looks at psoriasis flares attributed by exposure and withdrawal of systemic steroids. What did you think of this study, Dr. Vendor? Thanks, uh, Jeremy. And this has uh, been great podcast to do. I actually quite enjoy doing them. And I think that the rapport that we have is really good. The articles that are chosen for discussion are worthwhile and clinically practical. And I hope that our listeners are getting something out of this. So, Systemic steroids have been used for years to treat inflammatory skin conditions. And in the world, likely because of the low cost, it is very commonly used to treat psoriasis. The problem is, is the side effect profile that certainly can occur. And so quite often, one, if they're starting systemic steroids, wants to stop it as soon as they can. But Depending on how it's prescribed, and let's say it's prescribed by non-dermatologists, let's say, they may only use it for a short period of time. We have to think of what the steroids are really doing. They're taking away inflammation. They're making the white cells just go away so, so quickly. And because of that, if you withdraw that anti-inflammatory effect so quickly and you don't taper slowly, you can have this rebound. And generally, the rebound is a pustular flare. And the reason why it's a pustular flare is because the white cells are just coming so fast back into the skin, it makes these sterile little pustules. And so it's much better to taper than to stop the steroid abruptly. However, one has to remember that oral steroids are still generally safe and generally very effective in treating acute cases of psoriasis and are still have a low cost, as I mentioned. And More importantly, it's also used quite often in psoriatic arthritis patients to help relieve their joint pain and inflammation. So you will see patients that have psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis take short courses of a lower dose type of corticosteroid, such as 20 milligrams of prednisone for one or two weeks. That type of abrupt cessation should not cause a flare. It's those that are on higher steroids, such as 50 milligrams, that are stopping abruptly. And because of this, one has to be careful that they should probably taper the steroids in order to avoid this flare. Now, 
the physicians that are treating them may say, okay, wow, I got this flare. I got to go back on the steroid. Then they become steroid dependent and start to get side effects. So the key part will be to use a slow taper or a reasonable amount of taper in order to prevent this type of flare. Luckily in Canada, we don't see too much of this because of the access to other medications that are used, like biologics that are used for psoriasis. But you never know, it can happen. Sometimes there's even a misdiagnosis of dermatitis and there's no thought of of it being psoriasis and saying, oh, this looks like eczema or atopic dermatitis. I'm going to give it a, a short course of steroids and it really was psoriasis. Our next study looks at safety and efficacy in combined acetretin methotrexate therapy in pediatric psoriasis patients. What was your take on this study, Dr. Vender? Oh, thanks, Jeremy. You know, treating the psoriasis is not just limited to adults, that's for sure. We know that pediatrics is full of psoriasis patients, not as much as in adults. Adults is usually 1% to 3%. However, in Europe, where this, uh, this study was looked at, it's it's about half to 1% of the European children that will have psoriasis. And a very small portion of this will have severe psoriasis. Generally, patients that have psoriasis and are of the pediatric age do not have severe psoriasis, usually mild to, to moderate. And so one would like to treat with biologics. However, not all biologics are approved in children and can be quite unaffordable. And so you're left with traditional systemics, such as cyclosporin, methotrexate, or acetretin. And acetretin, one has to be careful because there is evidence that it could cause premature closure of epiphysis as well. So it seems that methotrexate is probably the best to use alone. When combining the acetretin and the methotrexate, you have to be careful because of possible liver damage. And certainly children are not happy with, first of all, usually taking pills or getting blood monitored, and they would need to have their blood monitored. And when you combine the acetretin and methotrexate, I would not use this, and I've not done this before, you have increased risk of hepatotoxicity, even in children. So it's not suggested that this is used in combination alone, uh, okay, alone, okay. I I think that I would tend to stick with one oral therapy such as acetretin or methotrexate. But again, I would be careful with acetretin. Also in females of childbearing potential, it's said that it can last for up to three years in the fat. Although when I did my training under the, the late Ricky Schachter, it was suggested not to use acetretin in any female of childbearing potential because of longer lasting effects with potential teratogenicity that can occur in females. One could argue, well, you know, if you're treating a pediatric and by the time they're female of childbearing potential, it's probably gone, but we don't really know. And so I think it's best avoided in all females that will not have necessarily childbearing potential But I guess, yeah, I guess you could say childbearing potential, because even as a young girl, she has that potential in the future to be, but not at that time. So, you know, the study was, it was a good study and it was retrospective. Uh, There was some prospective aspect to it as well. But I think that single agents are likely the safest to use and not to combine two systemic agents like acetretin and methotrexate in this group. And now biologics uh, are being approved quite rapidly for children, and this is a much better and safer option. Lastly, we have a study comparing adalimumab with methotrexase versus adalimumab monotherapy in chronic plaque psoriasis. What are your thoughts on this study, Dr. Bender? Thanks, Jeremy. Adalimumab is a historical now, historical TNF that has very great efficacy in the skin, in the joints, and can also help for inflammatory bowel disease. Rheumatologists will often combine it with methotrexate in order to have better joint response. And also there is a thought that possibly the methotrexate, in addition to the adalimumab, 
can reduce the anti-drug antibodies that can occur in this humanized form of, of TNF inhibitor. In other words, when patients take adalimumab, there is a small risk of some neutralizing and mostly non-neutralizing anti-drug antibodies that can occur, especially if you start and stop adalimumab. So it's not a good one to start and stop, but the risk is very low. And the thought is that with methotrexate, you may reduce this number of anti-drug antibodies, allowing the active adalimumab to be more efficacious. And so this study looked at 30 patients with just adalimumab and another 30 patients or so with adalimumab methotrexate. And those that were on methotrexate and adalimumab had better drug survival. And what does that mean uh, compared to those adalimumab alone? And it was about 16% more patients were still on that combination. So what does that mean, the drug survival? It means that if it's working, they're going to stay on it, and they're likely going to not lose effect, either from anti-drug antibodies or from a little bit less response. And so in doing so, you can stay on the drug longer and, and more safely, as long as they have proper drug monitoring. The patients had a better PASI response as well that were on a combination of adalimumab methotrexate than with uh, adalimumab alone. In addition to this, there were no serious side effects, which is good. So that combination is a very safe combination. So as we talked about last time in the last uh, article, that combination with tacitretin and methotrexate increases hepatotoxicity. The methotrexate and adalimumab uh, do not increase hepatotoxicity or have any type of uh, side effect at all. Our first listener question this week comes from Calgary, Alberta. This question is regarding our first study. How can we be certain that a patient's psoriasis flares are linked to a withdrawal of systemic steroids and not a product of other factors? Oh, Jeremy, thanks. That's a, that's a good question. And usually if it's a pustular flare, then you would think there have to be some kind of uh, systemic steroid rapid withdrawal. However, I've also seen it with topical steroid use uh, in high potency, such as clobetazole a lot of use of topical clobetazole, it gets stopped, patients run out or they move away and don't have any creams left. I guess it's the same as running out and they get a pustular flare as well. So I think in this case, it comes by history. It's very unlikely that it's uh, another factor that has caused this flare in a pustular form. People think of, oh, maybe infection did it. That is a possibility, but usually infection doesn't cause a pustular flare, may cause a flare of plaque psoriasis, but not in a pustular form. So it goes back to what we discussed before by looking at that rapid migration of white cells to the skin as a cause for those pustules. And I like to think of things in a simple way and not, you know, we can talk about the exact mechanism, but I think that just thinking of it that way, you, you have the steroids that, that make those white cells hide and go away and get rid of that inflammation. When you take away that anti-inflammatory effect of the steroids, boom, they all rush back. And so that's why you see that pustular flare. Our next question comes from elsewhere in Alberta. Other than drug survival, what are some other factors you value in an effective systemic therapy? Oh, that's a good question. I think maybe we have to say it came from Edmonton because elsewhere in Alberta, we have to say it came from or Drumheller. Drumheller is a cool place for questions to come from. That whole place is a is a big question mark. It's a very, very unique. So drug survival is one thing for effective systemic therapy. And let's just think of in terms of biologics. An effective systemic therapy has to improve the quality of life of the patient. It has to reduce the symptoms of uh, psoriasis. So for example, reduction in itch or skin pain. It should reduce the signs of psoriasis, the redness, thickness, and scale, reduce the body surface area. An effective therapy should work in special sites and have no bias towards what part of the body. So as it improves the skin and the typical elbows, knees, or body, you also want it to work in the genital area, then the scalp area, the pommel plantar, or even nails. That would be a really effective therapy. There's not one that does everything very, very well, but they do it quite well certainly quite well. 
I also think an effective systemic therapy, although it's a different category, really shouldn't have adverse events. So that would say, oh, that's not really efficacy. That's, that's a, a promising systemic therapy. But, you know, I think that that doesn't add to efficacy, but it certainly encouraged continued use to be able to experience that effectiveness that that medication can provide. Thank you, Dr. Vendor. Listeners, if you have comments or questions for Dr. Vendor, send them over. Send an email to health at chronicle.org. Add a voice clip attachment to your questions, and you might appear in a future episode of this podcast. If you enjoyed this podcast, please share it with your friends. You can subscribe at Apple iTunes, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. This podcast is produced in cooperation with Sun Pharma Canada. I'm Jeremy Visser of Chronicle Companies. Your host has been Dr. Ron Vendor, founder and director of Vendor Innovations and Psoriasis, a center of excellence for psoriasis, offering a comprehensive management solution for individuals with psoriasis. We'll talk again next week. Don't use that to try this. Set.